Hang in there. What up, what up, what up, though? What up, what up, what up, though? What up, what up? What up, what up, what up, though? Hey, y'all. Hey, hey, professionals. Hey, professionals. Hey, y'all. Hey, listen, we are coming to you live today to talk to you about mental health awareness. I am Glendora Devine. I'm a licensed professional counselor, board certified in telemental health. And what I wanted to do today is bring to you some information to help you live your best life. And why, how can you live your best life with this information? Well, basically, narcissists have been coming out loud and proud. And a lot of people are really questioning, like, what is gaslighting? What is, nar what is a narcissist? And how do I know if I'm being that person? or if I'm caught up in that type of relationship. Well, we're coming here today to bring it to you so you can actually hear about it, see about it, and implement some things to try and help you live your best life. So with no further ado, let me introduce this panel, okay? So today our topic again is narcissism, and we are all licensed professional um, counselors or social workers. So. With no further ado, I'm going to have each lady say their name and the name of their business. And um, with that being said, the information that we are talking about and we're saying, if you um, feel like we're going too fast, you're not catching it, all you're going to have to do is go follow me, myself, on Facebook. And it's a lady that's actually putting down everything that we're saying so you can actually go back and review it or catch what you need to catch in it. So the first person I wanted to bring to you, and so she could tell you her name, her credentials, and the name of her business is Miss Vaya Fraley. Please, Vaya, tell people who you are. Hello, um, my name is Vaya Fraley, and I am a dual licensed independent social worker and co-founder of I Am Legacy Counseling in Ohio and in Georgia. Yes, yes. The second person is Miss Carol. Miss Carol, Ida. please tell the people your name and the name of your business. Where they can find you? Hi, my name is Carolina Gilbert. I'm a licensed master social worker, and I am the owner of Serene Counseling and Wellness. I'm loaded, located right here in Michigan, and yes, I'm very happy to be here. Yes, yes. Now we have Miss Whitney. Miss Whitney Coleman, come on, tell the people who you are. <laughs> so I am Whitney Coleman. I am a clinical social worker in Washington, D.C., Maryland, and Texas. And I am the owner of Jade Clinical Services. Yes, Jade Clinical Services. Do y'all see the green? Okay. <laughs> and now Miss Rosetta. Come on, Miss Rosetta. Hi, everyone. I'm Rosetta Delancey, licensed master social worker. The name of my business is True Compassion Development Center, and I am located in Georgia. Yes. Okay. Now, you guys, we really don't take questions on this. We really just bring this to you so you can be informed and enlightened and understand what it is, what, how you treat it, what the symptoms look like. How can you cope with it if you are that person or if you are somebody that um, is living with that person or dealing with that person? And the last thing we want to bring to you are resources. So let's get into this panel discussion. And the first thing we're going to talk about is what is narcissism? OK, so ladies, um, you can go ahead and go backstage and let's get into it. All right. So and we're going to hear from. Miss Rosetta Delancey. What is narcissism? So to get started, narcissism is basically is a personality disorder that is primarily found in men, which is surprising, right? But yeah, so primarily it's found in men that um, they have this grandiose idea about their self. Like they just feel like the world revolves around them. In reality, the world does not revolve around them. So with that, also some of the factors that plays into them feeling this way has to 
first and foremost deal with genetics, but also it deals with environmental factors, things around them. Sometimes they may not have felt like they were important or being was even being seen by others. So now that they're of, of age and can do things for themselves, they're like, okay, it's about me. Everything's about me. I am God's gift to women. I did this. I did that. I did everything in the world. If it wasn't for me, nothing else would ever would have got done. You'd be surprised how many people that we have encountered have narcissistic, narcissistic, excuse me, tendencies. But it doesn't necessarily mean that they are narcissistic. Also, we have what's called gaslighting, which also a part of narcissism, which deals with emotional abuse. Sometimes, when it comes to feelings. And they try to play on your mind, make you feel like you're the reason that everything is happening. But in reality, you're not. They're the reason for that. So I had a client who he was actually diagnosed with narcissism. Nar excuse me, can't say the word right. Narcissism. He was um, diagnosed with that from a previous provider. What happened was he would also like he was married and sometimes he would gaslight his wife or he was very emotionally abusive towards her. Like when she wanted, when she needed love and affection, he refused to give it to her because he felt like she should cater to him that he walks on, you know, money, like everything was about him in reality. It wasn't. So we had to work together to kind of help him to realize that you have a partner, you married this woman. So sometimes you have to compromise. Sometimes you have to listen to her side of the story to see what she's saying, what she needs from you. And so as we continue to go through that, he started to understand what I was saying to him. And with that, he was starting to be more intentional towards his wife and things that she needs. Sometimes they can be violent. If you are trying to leave them, They'll do whatever they can to pretty much keep you there. But it's not that it's you can get through it. It's just going to take some time. So if you feel like you are displaying some narcissistic tendencies or a mate or a spouse, maybe you might want to keep your eye open to pretty much see what's going on before you just jump ship. But if you feel like you need to get some help, I would definitely say, reach out to somebody. Can't hear you. What is it? Um, Cause you, I love the thing that you always like people to remember. What is that? Oh, if you don't remember anything else, always remember to love your natural beauty as well, as well as your enhanced beauty. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. You got to say that. OK, so when you were saying um, narcissists usually are typically more men than they are women. Is that what you found in your study? Yes, ma'am. OK. And then you was like it was really about um, it's a lot of the environmental factors that is really play a part in what the men are going through and what they're thinking in order mm -hmm. to turn them into this. Um, type of personality. Yeah. Okay. And then I think when you were saying like be intentional of others needs, that's something that you said that you told the client in mm -hmm. order to do and that helped him tone down the narcissist uh, personality. Is that what you're saying? Not so much as tone it down, but being mindful of some of, you know how sometimes um, our behaviors, because we've been doing it for so long, mm -hmm. it becomes second nature to us. We sometimes don't even realize that we're doing it. So when I told him to be more intentional, meaning being mindful of what you're doing, or if you see that your wife is upset or she's crying, instead of like lashing out on her, take a minute to listen to what she's actually saying, because there very may well be some validity to what she's saying about what she's feeling. We can't control how someone else feels towards us. Right. Only thing we can do is control how we react to them or the things that we're doing. So if your wife tells you she does not like something that you're doing, it is your job to either fix it, acknowledge it, or do nothing at all. But you have a choice in what you do, or how you respond to her. Okay. And you know, sometimes, you know, it's not the wife, you're not married, you just in the relationship, right? Correct. So 
you know, I, I think when, when you speak of it's a lot of the environmental factors when you start to first date somebody, is that something that we should be really looking at is like how they were what raised or how, how do they interact with their people today? How do we, how can we, if you're not married and you're going through the dating part and you uh, want to be mindful of narcissistic personalities and you think about the environmental factor, what is like one thing that we can question ourselves or question the person and see if, you know, where they land on that. So I would definitely, you know, you can always talk about ex, you know, talk about each other's childhood, how they were raised. Cause mm-hmm. not every person that was raised in a horrible childhood turns out to be narcissistic. That's not the, the idea, but it's more so like when you're having a conversation or if there's something, if you have an argument and you've noticed a trend, if every time you're having an argument, say for instance, if you caught the other person cheating and you bring it to their um, to their attention and they turn the subject around and well turn the blame instead of them acknowledging that they were wrong, they're blaming you for that. That's okay. To think about. Okay. So they're not really accepting responsibility. Just keep flipping the stuff back on you. So mm-hmm. it's not really like you having a real conversation with this person. You almost you can't. Yes. Okay. All right. Well, thank you. And please don't disappear. Uh, once again, what is the famous words that you like to leave people with again? And tell me your name one more time, even though I know it. But please say it. <laughs> okay. So my name is Rosetta Delancey, licensed master social worker. If you don't remember anything else, remember to always love your natural beauty as well as your enhanced beauty. Hey, all right. Okay. And that, in order to love your natural beauty, you got to have a two-way conversation, not a one-way. <laughs> okay. Now let's look at, that's what narcissism is. Let's look at how to treat it. All right. So um, let's jump into that one right quick and see what that's going to look like. If I can get my lady to come on up on the screen. Uh, got to come out of the background. <laughs> All right, let's see. They're coming, y'all. Just give me a second. They um uh, just trying to fight through the uh the thing. Are you there? What happened to you, baby? All right, here we go. Is that you, Via? Oh my goodness, what happened to my peoples? All right, see if I can get them to come back on screen right quick. Okay, there she is. There she is. Miss America. (laughs) There she is. There she is. All right, we're just going to talk about now, you guys. um, We talked about what it is. Now we want to just talk up a little bit about like how do you treat um, narcissism? And we're going to let Via Fraley come to us. Via, go ahead and. Give me your credentials again before you start, and um, then just go ahead and tell us how to treat this. How do we treat this? Okay, okay. Um, so I am a dual licensed social worker, clinical social worker, um, and we are going to um, talk about a client that I worked with, um, came to therapy. She was in a two-year relationship and it ended badly. Although she had been cheating and lying the entire relationship, he had actually caught her in the act, and that's what ended the relationship. And she was pretty upfront that she did not feel upset by the breakup, but she was more upset at he was planning a pretty nice vacation for her, and she wasn't going to be able to go on it. And another thing that has stuck in her head is that at the end of the relationship, he said that she was not emotionally available, that she only cared about herself. So literally this client came to therapy wanting to know if there was something wrong with her. And I had to be honest, I couldn't be judge or jury on that, Um, but we were able to work together and come up with therapy goals that surrounded her recognizing her emotions and her thoughts and also who she truly was as a woman. So 
with something like narcissistic personality disorder, um, you have specific treatment that you want to do. So one is psychotherapy or what you may know as talk therapy. And the National Alliance on Mental Illness, or NAMI, recommends one of those psychotherapies be cognitive behavior therapy. This really gets into learning how to change your thinking to change your behavior. Um, so being able to understand how your thoughts and emotions and actions are all connected and reframe the way that you may typically think. Um, with this personality disorder, it's a fantasy, it's a grandiose um, self-esteem, and they may put up a front that's not really there. So being able to reframe that and saying that it's okay to be yourself um, is really going to be a key factor in therapy. And so for this personality disorder, and keeping engaged in therapy is going to be very important. Um, so one way I like to do that is include people that they do have somewhat meaningful relations with to keep them motivated um, and coming back. Because something that can happen with this is that you can wake up one morning and think, hey, there's nothing to work on. I'm perfect. And so being able to um, have family that you talk about your therapy sessions with, or even if there's friends that you can maybe hey, do you wanna do something with me after a therapy session? Or can you tell me what you like about me or which in your perspective I need to work on is a great way to keep them coming back. Also for clinicians, it's helpful to um, have a neutral attitude coming from what do you do well um, so that there's not a lot of tension in the therapy sessions because if you've been dealing with this personality disorder, you probably had it since youth. And so the way that you have been thinking is not gonna change overnight. So it does um, take a lot of patience um, and a lot of neutrality, but it is possible that someone with this disorder can overcome circumstance and thrive beyond adversity. I am Via Fraley. All right, Via. Um, let me see if I can get us on here together. Um, there we go. All right. So, yeah, Via, you know, something that you said this kind of like just what Rosetta said is she said is basically an environmental factor. And you just said, you know what, is something that you don't have since youth. So mm -hmm. something I think that people are not paying attention to is when we do talk about narcissism or narcissistic people or narcissism that is something that somebody has been carrying on for a long time, right? That's, that's what you guys are saying. Because you also stated um, it can be, you know, cured. You can stop having these personality traits like this, but it's going to take patience and maturity. Mm -hmm. so that means that, um, and I'm just saying, so just help me if I'm, you know, if I'm not right, but I'm thinking like, if that's what it's going to take to help somebody with narcissism, then I got to already automatically be aware that I got to allow this person to grow here, to grow in a mind, to li literally say, um, yeah, let me get into the, the, um, thought process of being intentional about somebody else's needs and not just moving through and expecting them to adhere to mine. But I'm going to consciously try and be mindful about somebody else's needs. Is that about right? Right. And being able to role model back for them. Because mm -hmm. a, a lot of the just a lot of the personality is that you don't necessarily think about somebody else's needs first. So mm -hmm. if that is just your personality to think about others to be giving then you definitely want to role model that in the relationship um that you have with this person and talk about what that looks like for you and vice versa okay and you were highlighting like the treatment for somebody who has narcissistic personality disorder or um 
or we are saying that they are narcissists is that they should go to individual counseling and with a therapist that's using uh, what modality did, did you say cognitive behavior therapy short for cbt okay and so and with that you um also i think you are saying too like if that therapist is aware of motivational interviewing because you were saying something like the person um the therapist need to be mindful to keep the person motivated to come back to therapy yes so to keep um engaged and this can be the therapist or it can be the person who has um, the personality is that you want to make sure that you're including people that you have meaningful relationships with in your therapy. Um, oh. Of course, you can do individual uh, counseling. You may also want to ask your therapist about like a support group so you can be able to relate to others or okay. the people that are already in your community, like you're, if you're in a relationship if you have friends, being able to share your therapy experience with them so they can kind of hold you accountable for going back. Because okay. what happens is you, you can wake up one day and you can think there's, I'm okay. There's nothing I need to work on anymore. I think everything's okay. But the reality of it, if you actually start going to see a therapist for uh, issues connected to narcissistic personality, then don't just stop on your own stop with the guidance of your therapist saying, you know what, let's go ahead and just meet every six months and let me see how you've been uh, moving through life uh, on your own in six months with your relationships instead of just doing a cold turkey. Absolutely. Basically. Absolutely. At least during a monthly, um, starting off weekly, I would, mm -hmm. you know, build the engagement with your therapist and build that rapport um, but if you feel like there's those stressors aren't there that led you to therapy anymore, um, then at least getting on a monthly plan to kind of talk about how things are going. So let me ask you about medication, Vaya. Is that one of the things that is looked at for narcissists? Well, medication is outside of my scope. Um, but sometimes people with personality disorders can be diagnosed with mood disorders like depression or anxiety. So those can be another focus of treatment. And with those, you can um, refer to a psychiatrist to talk about what can help with those symptoms. But for something like personality disorder, there's no medication for that. This is um, a personality or something lifelong that um, is beneficial with behavior therapies. Yeah, so the maturity, you're basically going to grow into growing up and wanting to basically grow up. And But it takes a lot of patience as well. So when we're working with somebody like that, we really want to make sure that not only that you, the person that is, is seeking the treatment, give yourself patience, but as the mental health clinician that you're working with, they need to understand that you know, practice patients as well as you go to carry somebody through this disorder. I'm like super excited that you spoke on not just treatment for what it looks like for that individual, but what it will look like for the therapist as well. Great mm -hmm. job, that. Thanks for bringing us into this and helping us because there's probably some of us watching. So to let us know, to be mindful of the patients and to um, interject if we're dealing with somebody like that, to make sure that we advocate for them to have a partner to um, to keep them motivated to come back. Good job with that. Um, before I let you go, when you were talking about staying motivated to try and come back and having that support group, do you think social media is a way to have a motivational support group to get back to stay into you know therapy or to to get a team? Because I know a lot on TikTok. Um, mm -hmm. You can just follow a TikTok train of narcissists and hear a, a bunch of stories or whatever. Or is even one guy saying that you know I am and I've been working on myself, so I'm just taking y'all through my journey as I go through it. Mm -hmm. Do you think that's a good way to to literally um, create uh, motivation or inspiration to continue to seek help? 
Yes. So, I, of course, you know, social media is a double-edged sword. <laughs> Sometimes it can be information overload. But in terms of what you just said, um, you know, narcissism, narcissistic gets such a bad rap. And so truly being able to change that narrative with people who are coming out saying, I have this and this is kind of my journey can help create that community that they need to kind of be open to this new way of thinking or this new way of being. So I definitely think social support can be, uh, social media can be a good support for somebody with this personality disorder. Yay. Okay. Good thing. Um, y'all, I want y'all to know that this is the well-able therapist. So please go check somebody else because this is the well-able therapist. Via, what is the um, one thing you love for the people to remember about um, to go through their journey of life? Absolutely. Remember that you can overcome circumstance and thrive beyond adversity. Come through, Via. Okay, yes. So that was the treatment, you guys. Um, individual CBT. Now we're going to get into symptoms. What do it look like? Oh, what do it look like? So as my therapist comes to the stage, there she is. Um, we're going to get into what does narcissistic behavior look like? Come on, Ms. Whitney. Tell us them credentials again and uh, get into it. All right. So again, I'm Whitney Coleman. I'm a clinical social worker in Washington, D.C., Maryland, and Texas. Um, and I'm the owner of Jade Clinical Services. So I'm going to start just kind of giving you an example of some behaviors just to kind of show you what it could look like. Um, so I once worked with a client who presented as extremely sure of himself. He was well-educated, well-spoken, handsome, dressed well had a good job, a nice car. And the only thing he really said that he was missing was basically a good partner. And he didn't understand why all of his relationships failed. He described himself as a really good catch. Um, he also said that all of his prior relationships ended amicably, but he said that he wasn't in contact with any of his former partners. So it was one of those situations where I didn't quite understand if they were ending amicably, he wasn't in contact with them, he wouldn't provide any further context, but I just kept digging. He also was saying all this, but this wasn't the reason he sought services. So I continued working with him, tried to get more information, trying to figure out what was going on. But he started coming up with excuse after excuse as to why he was better than his partner. And he started saying his partner needed to acknowledge that he was better than he, better than her. He started saying that he needed to spend money. He needed to get a nicer car. He needed to get a nicer apartment. And this led to issues in his relationship because his partner couldn't afford to move to apartment. And he wanted the partner to, the partner to spend money on this apartment and pay for half the rent. Um, he began getting more comfortable with me. He began expressing things and saying he was more important and how he wanted to be prioritized because he felt his job was more important than the, car than the partners and he made more money. Um, essentially, he started saying things such as, well, since I bring home more money, I'm more important, I'm doing things, she should be cleaning the house. The partner worked a job that worked, you know, worked longer hours, was out more, but there was no accommodation for that. This continued to go on. And then he began saying things such as, well, you know what? She's not really even good enough for me. I need a high powered doctor. I need a lawyer. I need a politician. I need someone that I can show off who's good enough for me. And so he began putting her down, telling her she wasn't important, doing all of these little things over time. Eventually this relationship ended. He didn't provide clarity as to what happened and why the relationship ended, but right after the relationship ended, he stopped seeing me. There was not a lot of information to tell me that he qualified for the definition of narcissistic personality disorder, but he did display a number of symptoms of narcissism. And why I thought that this was a good example of the situation is I'm talking about the symptoms of narcissism 
And there's a difference between having narcissistic features or traits and being diagnosed with narcissistic personality disorder. And a lot of times people who actually have narcissistic personality disorder do not make the effort to come in and get help. And so it's important to note that people can have these traits, have these tendencies, and seem to be pretty bad and treat people badly, but not necessarily rise to the level of narcissistic personality disorder. But they can be very close to it. So it should be noted that there are nine criteria that you need to meet to be diagnosed with narcissistic personality disorder. However, you only need to meet five of those criteria. So there are nine criteria, but you only need to meet five of those. The most important thing is that in order to be diagnosed with narcissistic personality disorder, these criteria need to be pathological, meaning that they are extremely unhealthy in nature and they interfere with your daily functioning and your ability to relate to others. That is the most important thing. So an easy way to remember these symptoms is an acronym called Special Me. Um, shout out to Duke University for that acronym. I love it because it speaks to the narcissist way of thinking. I'm special, special me. So the first thing is a sense of self-importance is unreasonably high. So a narcissist may have this sense of self-importance that's high. They may think that they have all these achievements and that their talents are bigger than they actually are. The second thing is they may be preoccupied with power, beauty, or success. They want to have the best of everything, the best car, the best office, the best clothing, the best spouse. They just really want to have the best of everything and they're preoccupied with it. The third thing is a sense of entitlement. They feel that they are deserving of privilege and special treatment, and they expect to be recognized as superior to other people. Um, the fourth thing is they can only be around other people who they feel are important or special. The fifth thing is they can exploit others for their own personal gain, which means they expect favors. They expect others to do things what they want without question, and they just generally take advantage of other people. The sixth thing is being extremely arrogant. They criticize other people. They look down on other people. They feel others are not important. They can come across as extremely conceited. The seventh thing is they lack empathy. They're unable or unwilling to recognize the needs and wants of others. The eighth thing is they must be admired constantly or excessively. They turn to other people and constantly ask them, do I look good? Am I doing well? It's always constantly needing to have that reaffirmation of how good that they are. And the ninth trait is they are envious of others or they believe others are envious of them. So the catch is that narcissism can fall on a spectrum. So you have people who are really high functioning and they're relatable, but they also can be charming. But there's also people who are aggressive and challenging and they can end up in a hospital. So there's a huge spectrum of different behaviors of people who have narcissistic personality disorder. There's also a high rate of what we call comorbidity. So they tend to have other physical or mental health conditions. They may have anxiety, they may have depression, they may use drugs, they may have a variety of uh, medical conditions that occur with narcissism for a variety of different reasons. Um, they also have what are called adaptive and maladaptive behaviors. Adaptive means that these narcissistic traits that they're uh, demonstrating, such as like a sense of authority or a drive to be self-sufficient, can help them be successful in their career. 
So they may express like they may express these uh, traits, but they're also really successful. So it doesn't necessarily come across as a negative thing. While these maladaptive traits, such as being condescending or aggressive or exploiting others, tends to be negative and affect their relationships with others. So it's going both ways and you have a little bit of a positive thing and a little bit of a negative thing. So with that, you might see some of these behaviors in a daily life. You might see them belittling, belittling others. You might see them being rude to others. You might see them becoming impatient or angry. You might see them having difficulty managing their behavior or emotions. You might see them becoming slighted very easily. You might have, you might see them having difficulty adapting to change. You might see them withdrawing from situations where they feel like they're failing. You might see them becoming depressed. Uh, you might see them having difficulty handling criticism or any sort of any sort of discussion of their work. Um, you might have them believing others should be obedient to their wishes or that the rules don't apply to them. Um, they might believe their rules, their needs always come first. They might brag or exaggerate their accomplishments. They might have outward displays of their intelligence, their wealth, beauty. They might have difficulty taking responsibility for their behavior. They might also be underachieving and set low expectations for themselves because they have a sense of entitlement that they will just be given things. Um, they might be manipulative. They might act like the worst person on the face of the earth because they want to get you to do things. Um, they might not be able to apologize. They might lash out on you if they feel like they're being criticized or judged. They might engage in gaslighting. They might use antagonism. They might be hostile and they might be um, engaging in hoovering. So a lot of these behaviors are common things that we see and they result in complications such as divorce, problems at work, uh, personality disorders, eating disorders, drug and alcohol abuse, and suicidal ideation. Um, so with that, I am going to log off, but I just want to let you guys know that a journey of a thousand miles begins with a decision. Well, before you go, let me see, mm -hmm. I can fix the screen. Um, let's see, let's, let's see. Girl, I don't know how to do it. So listen, before you go, um, you can still hear me, right? So I want you to um, to talk to me about, seriously, that acronym that you came up again, uh, with from Duke University. Just go over that one more time, because I think when we start thinking about these symptoms, this is what we're trying to figure out. So if you can go um, go over that part again, maybe it'll stick um, and my scriber can catch it and she can type it in there so people can look at it. So try one more time for me, please. I did go over it very fast because I had a lot of information. It's okay, please. Uh, so the acronym is Special Me. So the S stands for sense of self-importance being unreasonably high. The P stands for preoccupation with power, beauty, success, anything along those lines. E is for feeling entitled. That's having that sense of entitlement. C is for they can only be around people who are important or special. I is for interpersonal exploitation for their own gain. A is for arrogance. L is for lack of empathy. M is for must be admired constantly and excessively. And E is for envy of others and believing others are envious of them. 
Okay. All right. Uh, good job. Because um, it's very important to be able to say, you know, what when we say narcissism, are we able to say some of these behaviors that go along with it? And you were saying that basically it's nine things that we as mental health clinicians look at to diagnose somebody with this disorder. But we out of the nine, all the person have to do is satisfy Five. how many? Five. Five. Okay. Thank you so much with your beautiful self, girl. Okay. Um, please don't go away because we got to come back and say bye later. But we got one more person. I truly appreciate all that you just delivered because it really was clear about what it is, what we should be looking at far as symptoms of somebody dealing with um, narcissistic personality traits. Um, no. Okay. So let's get into what is the coping skill. So we're going to talk to Miss Carolina. Hello. All right. You're here. Hey, hey, hey. Um, so yes, okay. again, my name is Carolina Gilbert. I am the owner and therapist at Serene Counseling and Wellness, and I'm here to talk about the coping skills for narcissism. So, you know, we learned that narcissism is when you have a, a sense of self-importance, thinking very highly of yourself. You live in this kind of fantasy world and have a, a sense of grandeur. We learned that you have a sense of entitlement. You can demean or bully people that you encounter. And, you know, sometimes they may look like monopolizing meetings or conversations or needing that constant praise and attention. So how do you deal with that? Um, so I have a client. Um, more specifically on the other end that's dealing with and dealt with someone, their partner who has narcissism. So my client came in um, really having a lot of distress over the relationship that they were having with their significant other. Um, in more discussion about you know, what was going on, the client who had low self-esteem would say that every time she, they decided to make a decision, their um, their partner was always saying how it wasn't a good decision um, and really invalidating them. The partner would then interject their own um, opinions about the decisions that they should be making. Um, when the client wanted to go hang out with their friends, they constantly received that validation and the confidence that they needed. But whenever they went back to their partner, that partner would devalue them and always make it seem like they had the best decisions they were a good decision maker and just really making my client feel less than themselves. So in talking, you know, more about my client with my client about this relationship and pulling things out, it was very emotionally abusive to her. And it was, um, it was never physically, but, you know, very emotionally abusive to them where they would just feel so drained from being in that relationship and just feel like, oh my gosh, like, you know, I, I'm trying to better myself. I'm trying to better our relationship. But every time I try and every time I make suggestions, they make it seem like they're the only right one. They're the only one that has good suggestions. And every once in a while, they'll provide that support and encouragement. But it was very few and far between. So how do you deal with someone who has that this type of personality disorder? So I um, found some coping skills, not only to help a person that has narcissistic personality mm -hmm. disorder, but those that have a partner that they're trying to deal with and cope with um, their disorder. So things can be a little complicated when you have to um, utilize coping skills to deal with narcissistic personality disorder and these tendencies because people are with this disorder are often very sensitive to feedback from others and they can react in rage if they're confronted. They can also feel slighted or ignored. Um, that's not to say that people, you know, as previously discussed, people with narcissistic personality disorder, a lot of them do want the help and seek out the help. But the the treatment and using the skills to be able to, to shape and change these behaviors is hard work because it's a part of who you are. So here are some coping skills if you do have or notice that you may have um, whatever level of narcissistic personality disorder. Identify the triggers of the behaviors you want to change. So look at, you know, how you react in certain situations. Look at your behaviors and identify those things. You're like, hey, this isn't healthy. Hey, people have given me feedback on these things. These are the areas and the behaviors that I want to change. 
identify triggering situations. So, you know, we all have situations where we get triggered. So if it's at the office or if it's, hey, when I'm in um, a meeting with someone or if I go to a fancy dinner and, you know, maybe I don't have the best outfit or maybe I feel a certain type of way when I go this meet, to this meeting, identify your triggering situations, figure out what those look like. Um, once you identify the behaviors you want to change, you know, the, um, sorry, once you figure out the behaviors you want to change, um, imagine your ideal reaction. How do you want to react in these situations? So you have the behaviors you want to change. You know, what is the thing you're going to combat it with, which goes back to the treatment, cognitive behavioral therapy. It's all about taking this one behavior and saying, how can I combat it with a better, more appropriate behavior? Um, inhibit or delay unwanted behavior. So find ways to delay um, your reaction to certain stuff. Um, a lot of times when I tell my clients, if they're in an argument with their, you know, significant other, spouse or friend, you know, sometimes it's beneficial to take 20, 25 minutes away um, or give yourself 20 seconds or a minute to really think about your reaction before you react, because that gives you time to reflect on it. Um, to say, okay, maybe I shouldn't say that. Maybe I shouldn't do that. So um, inhibit or delay unwanted behaviors and figure out what method works best for you. Um, and figure out a new response. So, you know, that's the same thing of imagining your ideal reaction. So if you're so used to saying, um, like, for example, if um, if you're so used to saying, yelling at your kids, if you're in, um, if you have this issue, yelling at your kids and tell them how worthless they are, you never do anything right, Submit a new response, say, hey, when you did this, it really made me feel this type of way. So that way you're expressing your feelings, how it made you feel, instead of lashing out in an anger response because of those feelings that you're having. Um, manage your expectations. A lot of times we get um, people who have narcissism or people in general get have difficulty with our expectations. We expect something to happen a certain way. And because it doesn't, doesn't we don't know how to react to it. So we may react in anger and frustration. And this is especially difficult for people with narcissism because they expect things to go a certain way. They have a certain standard and the, their outlook on the world and the way they want to receive stuff. So changing their expectations of what they should receive and what should happen can also help with how the behaviors and the reactions that they want to display. Um, learn to accept criticisms. Um, people with narcissism doesn't, don't like to be criticized. So learn to accept criticism, learn how to take it in, think about it, think about your behaviors, think about your reactions, take it in and reflect on it. Distance yourself from enablers. Those people who are feeding into that negative behavior that you're having, um, making you think that it's acceptable. Once you start to, once you decide that, Hey, this is an issue I may have, look at the people surrounding you and have people around you that hold you accountable to those negative behaviors that you're displaying and not just feeding into the behaviors um, that you're displaying because they may benefit from it or they don't want to disappoint you or they're afraid of your reaction. You want somebody that can challenge you in a, in a way that you can receive it as you're starting to make these changes within yourself. And lastly, seek professional help. If you're having difficulty establishing these boundaries, these changes that you're wanting to establish with yourself, seeking a professional help from a therapist or a support group can definitely help you meet your goals. Now, if you're like my client who's in a relationship with someone who's displaying some of these behaviors, what can you do? Educate yourself. Make sure you're knowledgeable about narcissism, pers narcissistic personality disorder. You know, we all have our idea of what it is, but what does it really look like? So do your research, educate yourself. The best way to know how to handle something is to have the knowledge. Build your self-esteem because people with narcissistic personality disorder really um, have an issue with demeaning others if it doesn't fit their narrative. So you have to find ways to build your self-esteem so that when you have to challenge these behaviors and set these boundaries, you have the confidence within yourself to be able to do that. Speak up for yourself. That's the same thing as building that self-esteem. If you want something or you want some changes in some behavior that this person that you're with, um, whether it be an intimate relationship or whether it just be a friendship or a coworker, speak up for yourself. You know, sometimes your, your voice needs to be heard in this relationship so they realize, hey, 
this is something that's not healthy. This is something someone's bringing to my attention. I need to address this. Set clear boundaries. Boundaries are helping in any relationship, especially with those with narcissistic personality disorder. So you have to set boundaries with that person you're in a relationship with so they know how to treat you, what your expectations are, and, and just how far they can go with you, you know. And in the same token, this helps them to know, okay, these behaviors that I'm exhibiting are not healthy. I need to re-examine them because my person in my life is establishing these boundaries. Why are they establishing these boundaries with me and why are they healthy? Uh, Practice skills to keep calm. You know, when you're dealing with someone with a personality disorder, it is ingrained in them. And we know because it is a diagnosis that it's something abnormal. So anytime you have to deal with something abnormal, it's going to take a little bit more of you to be able to deal with that. So find coping skills, other ways to stay calm. Like if it's walking away for a minute, if it's listening to some music, if it's counting to 10, find ways to be calm in those situations where you're dealing with someone with narcissistic personality disorder so that you can guide them, help them. Um, through their goals, and just continue to facilitate a relationship with them if that's something that you choose to continue to be involved in and whatever aspect of relationship it is. Find a support system. You know, just like how they need support in um, getting their symptoms under control, finding support for you as a person who deals with this is important because you have to deal with this maybe on a day-to-day basis if you're in an intimate relationship with them or, you know, whatever facet, find a support system so you have someone to talk to, bounce ideas off of, and just so you know you're not alone in this. Insist on immediate action, not promises. People with narcissistic personality disorder are very good at making promises, but not following it through on them if it's going to end up being where they have to give up something or where it's not going to benefit them. So when you ask something of someone with narcissistic personality disorder, ask them, and expect it. I don't need a promise. I need you to do this. I need immediate action. I need to see the results of what I'm asking you to do. Get um, get that professional help. If it's couples counseling, if it's family therapy, whatever it is, once again, get that professional help if you need it. Um, it's important to set boundaries and communicate clearly when dealing with someone with narcissistic personality disorder. Confronting them about their behaviors, like calling them a liar or expecting them and expecting them to change is not going to help. You have to use different tactics in talking to them. You have to set clear boundaries and, and express yourself using your emotions and feelings and thoughts to convey what you're thinking. In the same token, a person with narcissistic personality disorder has to train themselves to really hear a person, to listen and empathize with the emotions and thoughts that are being expressed to them. If you're also another coping skill is how do you know when to move on? If you're experiencing any physically, emotional, or verbal abuse from someone that has narcissistic personality disorder, it may be time to move on. Name calling, insults, patronizing you, public humiliation, yelling or threatening, um, you feeling isolated, you're feeling manipulated or controlled. If you're experiencing any of these things, Um, It may be time to take stock and say, hey, is this a relationship that I want to continue to further? Is this a relationship I feel safe in? Or am I feeling isolated and separated? So um, that's another coping skill, when to know when to move on. That's not to say you don't care about this person that has this disorder, but sometimes you have to pull away and that is your coping skill is to separate because it may be unhealthy for you to continue to be in that relationship with them. So these are some coping skills that you can utilize, whether you have narcissism or whether you're dealing with someone with narcissistic personality disorder. So in all this, remember that healing has different paths. Find your way to be well. Hey, girl, you were throwing down with that. Um, (laughs) Yes. um, What I wanted to um, highlight with what you were saying is the reality is that it sounds like when we're dealing with somebody with narcissistic personality traits is that they are super sensitive they are and they don't like negative feedback they do not they do not it definitely takes a person with narcissistic personality disorder a level of growth to be able to receive that um, criticism from others but also to look within themselves to see like hey 
you know, this is something I need to work on. And um, they will respond when you do talk to them. They respond by feeling slighted, you said? Yes. Like, okay, like you just tried them. Like, you tried me. Right. Instead of actually giving them constructive feedback. Mm -hmm. So you have to be very careful with your words because if, you know, if they're not in a position to receive that constructive criticism, they're going to say, oh, you're insulting me. You know, I'm, I'm feeling slighted. I'm feeling like you're attacking me. I'm going to respond in anger because I'm, I'm always right. This is, you know, I have importance. I have this ideal world. So it's going to be a hard pill for them to swallow if they're not ready for it. Okay. And then the, uh, the one of the feelings that you brought up that it sounded like it was a reoccurring one from Vaya and Rosetta um, and Whitney is that we have to be m mindful that this person has a tendency to be angry all the time or easily a lot when mm -hmm. they are being questioned. Yes. Anger is a trigger. It's it's kind of like um for those who have been in therapy and um, when you have difficulty um, navigating your emotions and your feelings, you know, you, you respond in anger because everything floods you at once. And if you don't know how to empathetically respond to people like narcissism tend to, narcissistic tend to have, then you're going to respond in anger. So it's just going to come out in that way. The other thing that I wanted to um, point out is that you said it, Vaya said it, Rosetta said it, that it's ingrained in you if you have the narcissistic personality. I think Vaya said it's from your youth. Um, Rosetta said it's from the, your environment. And then you look like, remember, it's ingrained in that person. So it's going to take time. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. okay. Yes. okay. So the main coping skill that I heard that I just wanted to piggyback off of, and I just wrote the word opposite. So the coping skill, if you are this person that is um, having these traits that um, Whitney went over, then what um, Carol is saying is literally do the opposite of what you want to do. That response, that's correct. Like mm -hmm. before you even react or respond, just be quiet and think of the opposite and do that. Right. A lot. And a couple examples that I saw was a lot of it is do the opposite, take that time because you have to tap into your emotions. Like taking that time allows that emotional part of your brain to turn off and that more rational part of your brain to come in and say, hey, how should I really respond to this? Okay. Thank you so much. What do you want the people to remember um, as you speak from Serene Counseling? I want you to remember that healing has different paths. Find your way to be well. Yes. Yes. All right, ladies. All y'all come back up here as we go over these resources because I want them to see your beautiful faces and let them um, remember who you are and what you represent. Um, again, um, I wanted to also say that you girls look very beautiful today. Um, and I thank you so much for giving me your time um, and coming on. Now, I'm going to... Um, read off some of your information and when i do you know make sure you just like raise your hands and, and show me a beautiful smile so they know who this is all right via fraley l-i-s-w-l-c-s-w the well able therapist her agency is called i am legacy counseling and consulting services and you can reach out to her and it should be in the chat i am legacy llc.com if you wanted to email her it's e info at I am legacy LLC.com. She do have some special offers for, uh, for you as well related to healing. Um, it's a journal. It's called a vessel hope journal journal of healing. So yeah, check out her journal as well. Um, again, reach out to her. If you do need to talk to her, you can reach out to her at, um, I think you're not, Zvaya, go ahead and give me your number, please. Yes, you can reach out to me um, at 614-706-1899. Thank you, babe. I thought that was a number. All right. Um, give them one more time. What do you want them to uh, walk away with and remember you by? So I want you to remember that you can overcome circumstance and thrive beyond adversity. 
Yes, yes. All right. And now we have Miss Carolina Gilbert, LMSW. Name of her agency is Serene Counseling and Wellness, the calming therapist. Okay. And <laughs> with that being said, you can find her at Serene Counseling and Wellness dot online and her contact information you can reach out to her for, via email at contact at serene counseling and wellness dot online her number is 248-598-4969 and um carolina just go ahead and tell them one more time what they need to remember as they go through this journey of life healing has different paths find your way to be well amen Okay. All right. Next, Miss Rosetta DeLancey, LMSW. Hey. I guess the name of her business is called True Compassions and Development Center, the True Compassion Motivator. That's who she is. And you can find her at truecompassion.services. Email her at info at truecompassion.services. She also, um, and I'm going to put the plug in, too, for Miss Carolotta. Um, all these ladies have beautiful healing journals that you can actually get a copy of. So please don't hesitate um, to reach out to them. Rosetta's is titled Protect Me. Okay. Um, and Rosetta, please, again, let them hear what they need to remember to, in order to live their life in true compassion. Okay. So if you don't remember anything else, always remember to love your natural beauty as well as your enhanced beauty. Yes. Yes. Let that compassion come out. Okay. And now <laughs> of day clinical services, let's step into the light of Miss Whitney Coleman, L-I-C-S-W, L-C-S-W-C. Yes. The growth therapist. Because you're going to grow if you mess with her, okay? So Jade Clinical Services, uh, she has a linktree.com that is at um, of Jade Clinical. And her number is 202-596-7162. And come through, Ms. Um, Whitney, and tell us what we need to remember. A journey of a thousand miles begins with a decision. Amen. It do. Y'all, I just want you all to understand that these women are all over the United States, okay? They are not just sitting next to each other in a room like we see us on this screen. So we are here to help you heal, heal as you go through your journey of life. And we really want you to remember that and know that. Also, we want you to understand that it, our national organizations are out there as well. So if we are not the ones to help you heal as you go through your journey of life. Please reach out to the Mental Health um, America um, organization at 800-969-6642 and always NAMI, National Alliance of Mental Illness. You can reach out to them at 800-950-6264. I am Glendora Devine and I'm a licensed professional counselor and you, my business is called Divine Systems Georgia Mental and Behavioral Health Agency and my website is dsgeorgia.com. If you wanted to call me, go ahead and do so at 678-212-5146. We are all here to help you heal in your journey of life. I want you to remember you only have one life. So live. Don't just exist. Thank you guys for tuning in and watching us today. And we will be back again to continue to bring you awareness of mental health. And if you like what you heard today, if you had any questions, drop them on the post wherever you see in this, um, this panel at, and we will get back with you. If you want to get contact with the ladies that's here, um, just drop it in on any one of these posts that you see this panel on, and we will get in contact with you. ASAP. We want you to heal and live your best life. And that is why we showed up today. Yes. All right, y'all. Take care and have a great day. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.